Okay, so Frankenstein. Key part of this, before we even get to the work, is the notion, uh, is the subtitle, or the modern Prometheus. Uh, the subtitle is more important than the title here, I would recommend, I would suggest to you, because it's about a scientist. It's about a scientist who's being likened to Prometheus. Who is Prometheus then, and what did he do? Now, there are two things that need to be said on that. There are, because the myth of Prometheus has many different strands. It's a Greek myth, first of all. Greek is, uh, Prometheus is one of the earth-born gods, the Titans, who are at war with the sky gods, the, the gods that are around uh, Mount Atlas. Um, so Zeus and Athena and so forth. Those, the, the earth gods, the sky gods, they're at war with one another. The earth gods lose. And Prometheus is punished by Zeus and company for uh, his rebellion, basically. And they're thrown down into the underworld and, and punished there and tormented. I don't know if you noticed that when you were in the underworld of, of Homer, but the, but the Titans are down there being punished in the underworld. They can't kill them because, again, they're gods, but they're being punished there. Uh, and Prometheus did a particularly heinous thing. There are two, two strands of it. So in the Greek myth, he gave fire to humanity. That was his transgression. You may say, so what? Well, fire was then used for all sorts of wicked means. This, it makes the earth gods look good, quite frankly, or the sky gods, rather, because with fire, mankind forges uh, weapons and steel and so forth. So they go from the golden age uh, into the silver age and then to the bronze age. And the bronze age is when Prometheus gives metal uh, tools. And metal tools are very useful. You can dig the ground. You can break up rock uh, and so forth. Uh, but of co course, you can also forge weapons. And the consequence of that is humanity further descends. And then we enter the Iron Age when it's, it's bloody and savage. So he's a bad guy. We're, we're happy with that. But a later myth of Prometheus, and this comes in the Roman period, adds another strand to the, to the myth, and that is that Prometheus may have, and, and Ovid mentions this in his Metamorphoses right at the beginning, that he may have created mankind out of the clay. So he's a demiurge figure. And that sounds like God's uh, work in Genesis 2, right? where God breathes into the clay and mankind becomes a living being. He gives the nephesh, the spirit of God, passes into him. Prometheus is said to do something like that uh, in fashioning mankind. So some have seen that as, you know, it's the same myth. And if you were taking a Jungian approach, you'd probably note the parallelism here. And then I don't even know what they would say about that. Um, for the purposes of this, those two myths are used by Shelley to talk about what Victor Frankenstein is going to do. One, he's going to do something against the gods by taking fire, in this case, lightning. And two, he's going to, with the dead bodies of uh, corpses that he's dug up from the cemetery, cemetery, he is going to create an eight foot patch together body and bring it to life. So desecration of bodies, which is a taboo in every culture that I know, pretty much, other than, I think, the cannibals. They'll eat the body for the same reason, I think. It's a strange uh, feature, never mind that. In general, it's a no-no. You don't, in, in the Bible, you don't even touch dead bodies. You bury them and that's the end of it. You can't go, it, it's, it's um, in, in Eastern religions, you burn them. In either case, you don't cut them apart and then put them back together. You, that, you don't do that sort of stuff. Modern science does this all the time. You probably did it yourselves in biology classes with, with frogs. I assume not people. They don't, they don't have enough. Well, they do it in the university, but they don't have enough. There's not enough bodies, and they're too expensive to hold, et cetera. But you'll do it with frogs and rats and mice and, and cats. I had a cat in mine. Or, Meow. Uh, it's pretty horrible, and they smell awful, 
you know, formaldehyde. I mean, the cat, if you've got cats and you gotta cut the cat, it's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Especially if somebody like me is meowing in the background. <laughs> Poor angry girls. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot to repent of. But, um, but vivisection, cutting into live bodies, Lewis objected to th this to the end of his life. He thought that there was some, something deeply wrong about vivisection. Interesting. And it wasn't the act of vivisection per se, it was that he thought that there was a sort of a taboo which if breached would, would not have a bottom to it. There would be no end to what we would do if we were willing to cut into people's live bodies. We're not necessarily going to agree with them. Think about modern medicine and all the you know, things with operations that you can do, etc. But I think the moral objection should be considered. He was also opposed, by the way, uh, to experimenting on animals. Same reason. A lot, pe a lot of people would be more strongly favorable to Lewis on that. So then the question to you is, why is it bad when you do it to animals, but not bad if you do it to humans? There's a consistency issue there. Experiments on animals, but not experiments on humans. It's called the Nuremberg Code, right? Well, I, animals can't give consent, but people can give consent. Or you can just waive that <laughs> and uh, do experiments on them anyway, but then I'll get political if we get into that. So I'll just drop that for now. That'll come up at another stage. That premise, though, of the modern Prometheus is uh, important to Frankenstein. Victor Frankenstein is a scientist, however, he's doing something that is transgressive. Victor is here just a, uh, a character of fiction. However, everyone in Shelley's readership understands her to be making an analogy between what Victor does and what science does in general. It's doing things that it has not questioned the moral legitimacy of or waived it in the name of making progress. Because that's how Victor sees himself. And the reason I say that is because we see certain uh, figures in this story that are, um, are clearly um, parallel figures. One of them is Victor Frankenstein himself. He sees himself, first of all, he is a scientist. Second of all, he sees himself as a benefactor to mankind. He's doing it for humanity, just like B.F. Skinner, right? If we're going to bring about progress, we need to be objective. We need to be scientific. We mustn't be squeamish. We need to get beyond the ideas of freedom and dignity. Secondly, uh, he is making progress through that. He's going to do something that's never been done before. Miraculous, godlike. But Shelley makes it clear uh, in her account that in order to do th this, he has to undergo certain self. Uh, he punishes himself, basically. He, he cuts himself from all, all society. He disappears for two years. He uh, disappears from his fiancee. He's, betrothed to a, a woman, he leaves her, or effectively he doesn't leave her, he just stops writing to her, he closets himself away and he hides in the dark and he is doing experiments by digging up dead bodies and he doesn't let anyone know about it. So there's something that he, even he is aware is wrong and he's being secretive about it. So there's a secrecy that science undertakes and that means by secrecy here, I'm just taking there's no public scrutiny over the morality of the experiments that they're undertaking on behalf of the rest of us. So he, she's critiquing science and its methodology for all its claim of objectivity. Is it opening to the moral scrutiny of the population of humanity on whose behalf it claims to be operating? And we meet, meet the uh, character who is, I'll have to blow this up. We meet the character who is going to become the cautionary tale of this at the beginning of the story. So 
uh, in terms of the structure of Frankenstein, this isn't a class on Frankenstein per se, but it's, it's an epistolary novel. It begins with three epistles, or four letters, and it has a, it has a, fra it's a framework narrative. So it begins with an outer frame, and the outer frame is the story of a man by the name of Isaac Walton. Remember, he's here at the beginning. And Isaac Walton is, is an explorer. And what is he exploring? He's exploring the Arctic. Why the Arctic? Well, he's trying to find the Northwest Passage. As an explorer, because that would be of great benefit to humanity to be able to find a shorter way to other areas of the Earth, and it would improve trade, and there'd be all sorts of incentives uh, and benefits to doing this. He goes up into the Arctic, and he finds himself in the midst of glaciers. Ice, it's a landscape which ever since Dante is uh, associated with hell. Remember at the bottom of the inferno, it's ice, encased in ice. I think we're supposed to understand that here. So the ice fields of the Arctic is, is a hellish landscape. It's, it's obviously a natural representation of it, but it's, it's forbidding to man. It's, it's uh, alienating. He has to ignore his shipmates who'd want to turn around and go back. The scientist is saying, no, we're going to carry on. I know better. You'll find other figures like this as well, Ahab and uh, Moby Dick and so forth. So a mad, great leader who's going to do things even though everyone else objects to that. And uh, this man, Walton, is that sort of man. He's doing it. He misses his family. His shipmates are against him, but he's going to do it for the greater good, even if it costs him and all of his crew, their lives, he's still going to press on. He is what uh, scholars like myself will call a Byronic hero, which if you've seen my take of uh, the rings of power, so is Galadriel. She's, she, she's an example of toxic masculinity. She is. People fall, she's like, <laughs> Weaklings, cowards, whatever. I mean, she looks like a man. She, or she didn't look like a man, but she's got the, you know. No, she doesn't look like a man, but, but she, more or less, they make her like a man, right? She's beating all the men at, at their own game uh, in, in just basically brute strength and, and will and determination, but wants to ignore uh, the consequences of her actions. So she's not a, it's, she's not a, a benign figure, in a sense, she's a character that represents an amoral will to power. And same with Isaac Walton. So what we, the reason I mention that is, I'm going to go back over this, but he's in St. Petersburg, so uh, Russia there, but he will eventually go back to, we'll meet at four. Uh, and now he's up in the, uh, up by the North Pole. And he meets a figure while he's up there. And the figure is none other than Victor Frankenstein. And Frankenstein is pursuing another figure who we find out is the monster. So we begin with the story of Isaac Walton, who is on a voyage up in the Arctic to find the Northwest Passage, and he's stuck in the ice. He, his crewmates want him to go back. He won't go back. While he's there, he meets Victor Frankenstein, who is chasing the Frankenstein monster. Then we hand over to Victor. So there's the story on the outside of Walton. That's the epistles at the beginning. Then we find Victor Frankenstein's story inside, the, the circle inside the circle, and we hear about how he got to the ice field in the Arctic. How did, we get, how did he get there? So we get his story. And then within that story, there's another story, and that's the story of the creature or the monster. So there are three stories. That's, that's the structure of it. By the way, at the end of the Frankenstein story, in case I run out of time, uh, when Walton hears Victor Frankenstein's story and the creature's story, he turns back and goes back home. He saves his crew, he learns the moral lesson, and he goes back home. Which is, note to the reader, there's a sort of a moral myth being taught here, and it's a cautionary tale. Here's how a scientist should not operate. Don't do this. Don't be like Victor. Monstrous things ensue. I just wanted to give the general framework because I'm not going to, I'll get lost in the details uh, in the intervening, what have we got here, half an hour. 
but he meets Victor on the ice field, and Victor is basically uh, against his mortal frame. He's basically on the verge of death because he's chasing a monster who's far more powerful, strong, resistant to cold, all, a superhuman basically, and he can't do it, but he's still going to chase him until basically he perishes, and he's rescued by Walton, and he's revived, and then he tells his tale. And, that, and that's so that the, the epistles at the beginning are just the way of setting the stage for the story of Victor Frankenstein. But it's not unimportant because, as I say, Walton ends up being the character at the end of the story who learns from the tale he's told and turns back home. And the reader is supposed to be in the position of Walton. If you're committed to scientific progress at the cost of all other things, maybe you want to think again. This is going to be a feature of part of the mythology of, of science fiction in general, I would say. And we'll see this next time with H.G. Wells. There is a sort of a, a moral questioning of the, what the scientists do in the name of science. The best science fiction, at any rate, does that. Uh, let me pass back. Where shall we go? I think I'll go to book two, chapter two, rather. Or is it three? Yeah, we'll see. I think it's three. I note they're reading the Knights of the Round Table, the Heroes of Roncesvall, the Chivalrous Train, etc. In other words, Victor is brought up reading heroic literature. He's trained in the humanities tradition. That's Victor's early upbringing. And he and his sister love this. And they have a friend, uh, Henri Clerval, who sticks with that. He, he becomes the human, the human figure representing the humanities traditionally understood. Henry's going to die like everybody else. Basically, everybody that Victor loves gets killed or die. Interesting. And again, um, you might say, well, that's a bit contrived or whatever. It is contrived. But again, it's, it's, it's an allegory. It's, it's supposed to represent the consequences of certain actions. So the consequences of the scientific pursuit of progress at the expense of all human considerations is the cost of every human being around you. So it's a commitment to progress at the expense of life. So there's sort of a moral mythology being presented in, in Shelley. They go to the Alps. Uh, come to three. And this is uh, important here for what follows later. Victor goes from his uh, forays and interests in the humanities to reading scientific treatises. And they're, they're not new to scientific treatises. They're those of a medieval age. And they're related to um, not necessarily the occult, uh, but more um, alchemy and so forth. So it's sort of a uh, different ways of doing science than modern science. So he reads the work of Cornelius Agrippa, Albertus Magnus, and Paracelsus, the lords of his imagination. He meets a figure who suggests that these scientists are not scientists at all. <laughs> and, and he is uh, persuaded by this. And uh, he says, all that had so long engaged my attention suddenly grew despicable. So he learns not to just change his opinion. He, l he hates that. And this is, not, this is telling. It, it relates to what I said about the, the critics hating Tolkien. He hates everything that he represented before. And the scientist hates it. And I'm, so, I'm not talking about scientists now. There's a viewpoint that all scientists don't hold, but is characteristic of the endeavor, which renders them an antipathy to human nature, as well as to God. Which is why the Hippocratic Oath now has got rid of the uh, prohibition, first do no harm, I would submit. Anyway, by one of these caprices of, of the mind, which we are perhaps most subject to in early youth, I at once gave up my former occupation, set down natural history and all its progeny as a deformed and abortive creation. Isn't that an interesting word? He sees the idea of natural law and the idea of creation 
as an abortive creation. It's a funny word to use there, right? Because what we're going to find hereafter is other figures of abortion uh, presented in the destruction of the, I mean, I'm, I'm getting ahead a bit, but I'm assuming that you've read the story. When Victor creates uh, the, the, the creature, the creature starts killing people and demands, I'm not going to stop until you make me a woman. Make me an Eve. Give me an Eve just like Adam have an Eve. You make one for that. Victor starts doing it to try and save his family. And then he looks around and he sees the sneering face of the monster in behind him and he, then he destroys the body on the table and it's presented in terms of an abortion. He aborts what he is doing but destroys a life on the table. So there's something, again, uh, this is not from a theistic point of view, but it's just describing Shelley is imaginatively rendering what I think is very viscerally real, uh, a hostility to a certain, not just a life, but a life connected with a certain moral uh, compass and import. So I at once gave up my former occupation, set down natural history and all its progeny as a deformed and abortive creation and entertained the greatest disdain for a would-be science which could never even step within the threshold of real knowledge. In this mood of mind, I betook myself to the mathematics and branches of study appertaining to that science as being built upon secure foundations and so worthy of my consideration. Well, what is that? That is Cartesian science and the scientific method. That's it. No reverence for life. Reverence, rather, for the thinking substance which makes everything conform to its image and is hostile to embodied existence and to the idea of any natural law or any creaturely existence, the idea that there is a creator and we are creatures, that has to go out of the discussion. So I noted when I became a Christian convert that not only had the public universities got rid of their statements of faith, in some cases centuries ago, in other cases in the last 70 odd years in Canada. They were all started by Christians, by the way. U of T was an Anglican foundation and Mac was Baptist and uh, McGill was Presbyterian, Western's Anglican. Uh, they're all rooted in uh, at least the historic universities. And then they dropped their statements of faith. And uh, you would say, well, that's, and now they're pursuing a sort of uh, dispassionate objective point of view. But you found that in the intervening time, they've also now turned in their, even in their humanities department towards a Skinner approach to understanding human nature and reducing it to something to be conditioned. And they've even dropped the Nuremberg Code now on that in most recent years. S thus strangely, he says, are our souls constructed. Isn't that interesting? That line, thus strangely are our souls constructed. What does that mean? What is the thus strangely? What's, what's, what's that referring to? I mean, it's in the mind of, of Victor here. It's when he abandons the adherence to one code of life and embraces another. And so his soul is being constructed at this point. It's, a, it's quite a profound statement. And he moves away from, and remember Lewis, uh, or remember, I said last time in his essay, De Descriptione Temporum, if you haven't watched it, watch the video I gave on that. He talks about how in the mid 19th century, there's a move away from experimenting on the natural world to experimenting on human beings. Mid 19th century, he says, I'm not sure exactly the date, but right around that time, there's this shift. And, uh, and Shelley's anticipating this. With her, with her fiction. She sees where it's going and it, that it will inevitably go there because the uh, commitment to the perspective here necessitates it. It's part of the core commitments of this point of view on which there's a, fix, a fixity of the thinking substance. It has to. Everything must be amenable to that and subject to it. It's the law. It's the the lordship of the mind over everything else, including the body. 
and nowadays it's presented in terms of self-identification and so forth. i'm the i'm the lord of my own sexual nature like i determine what i am, who i am by fiat declaration that's just an extension of the same process uh, in my mind. but he says thus strangely are our souls constructed and by such slight ligaments are we bound to prosperity or ruin so he says this in hindsight when i look back it seems to me as if this almost miraculous change of inclination and will was the immediate suggestion of the guardian angel of my life the last effort made by the spirit of preservation to avert the storm that was even then hanging in the stars and ready to envelop me her victory was announced by an unusual tranquility and gladness of soul which followed the relinquishing of my ancient and latterly tormenting studies it was thus that i was taught was to be taught to associate evil with their prosecution happiness with their disregard so note he immediately sees the moral significance the spiritual significance and even uh, speaks in terms of of hostility and hatred so he it's not just that he rejects the former he loathes it and that loathing as anyone knows but certainly in christian understanding it's our loves that determine uh, our, our identities in, in many ways, and certainly our actions. Remember Lewis's The Four Loves we looked at last semester, and falling in the August, Augustinian tradition, that we're, we, can call, we can call ourselves homo sapiens, we can talk about ourselves as, as rational beings, and rightly so, that's part of human nature, but we're first and foremost notable in terms of uh, our love, uh, our loving nature. And in particular, that God loves us and gave his son for us. That's an identity marker. We bear his image. Um, and, and so Shelley, who's not making a Christian commentary, still pushes it in that direction. It's, it's like profound for an 18-year-old. Remember this, it's extraordinary. It was a strong effort of the spirit of good, but it was ineffectual. Destiny was too potent, and her immutable laws had decreed my utter and terrible destruction. This is Victor speaking before he undertakes any of what he then does after. So Victor is aware at the end when he comes upon uh, Walton on the ice field that he himself brought about his own destruction and ruin. Right? It's not just saying this happened and this happened. He's inserting commentary right in the beginning. Well, what does he do then? He goes to a university of Ingolstadt, uh, studies. Uh, his darling Elizabeth dies of scarlet fever. Uh, his friend Clairval, uh, he basically uh, ignores and abandons. And then he goes to uh, a professor whose, whose name is uh, Monsieur Krempe, professor of natural philosophy. I rep uh, and he asked me several questions concerning my progress in the different branches of science appertaining to natural philosophy. I replied rather carelessly and partly in contempt, mentioned the names of my alchemists as the principal authors I had studied. The professor stared. Have you, he said, really spent your time in studying such nonsense? I replied in the affirmative. Every minute, continued Krempe with warmth, every instant that you've wasted on those books is utterly and entirely lost. You've burdened your memory with exploded systems and useless names you have to begin your studies entirely new. Okay, Shelley is not, by the way, pushing us towards uh, Christian uh, faith in any sense. Rather, she's pointing us towards a sort of uh, romantic uh, mysticism. A and uh, she uses alchemy to, f to present it because in a sense she believes in uh, the goodness, the, the sort of mysterious goodness of human life. Not, she doesn't talk in terms of Imago Dei stuff. That will come when Victor reads uh, uh, Paradise Lost. Uh, he'll talk about that, but she doesn't make anything about the Imago Dei. It's more the storyline. It's not the nature of humanity that becomes the uh, viewpoint. So Shelley's not very uh, sharp on this, but he goes, he does his studies, and then something extraordinary happen, happens. So uh, first of all, the, the new science. 
The ancient teachers of that science promised the impossibilities and performed nothing. The modern masters promise very little. They know that metals cannot be transmuted and that the, el the elixir of life is a chimera. But these philosophers who hands, whose hands seem only to be made to dabble in dirt and their eyes to pour over the microscope or crucible have indeed performed miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding place. Says they ascend into the heavens. They have discovered how the blood circulates and the nature of the air we breathe. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. This is a great ex exhibition of rhetoric. Who would not be moved by the progress of science? But know what he appeals to here throughout? Power. The other gave no power. It promised everything, it gave nothing. There's no power, but now we have got power over nature. Particularly, even it hints at human nature. We understand things and we have power over it. It's, it's, it's like the ring in Tolkien. There's a, it's the ring of power. It's the promise of power over uh, our nature. And he says, such were the professor's words. Rather, let me say, such were the words of fate announced to destroy me. As he went on, I felt as if my soul were grappling with a palpable enemy. One by one, the various keys were touched on, which formed the mechanism of my being. Chord after chord was sounded, and soon my mind was filled with one thought, one conception, one purpose. So much has been done, exclaimed the soul of Frankenstein, that's him. More, far more will I achieve. Treading in the steps already marked, I will pioneer a new way, explore unknown powers, and unfold to the world the deepest mysteries of creation. So he has delusions of grandeur. But note, it's about power. So he will, he will go on from that, and he will eventually do his experiments. But it, before he does that, he sees a terrific illustration uh, right in front of his eyes. And that is nothing other than uh, a bolt of lightning strikes uh, an oak tree and splinters it and destroys it. And that power of the lightning connected with the power that he seeks to achieve. He thought, ah, power. I'm going to use the power. And what am I going to do with this? I'm going to animate dead bodies through what uh, here is called galvanism. It's a theory circulating in Shelley's day. So we get the body on the table, wait for the lightning to hit, use the conduit of lightning like uh, Back to the Future. It goes down and zaps the body, and then up does life, and then the eyes open up. You've all seen the movies. The difference between the Frankenstein of the movies and the Frankenstein of the books is that this Frankenstein is like Adam. He's not a dumb brute. Uh, and he is presented as being, and this is also telling and also characteristic of, of modern science fiction, he sees his nature as fundamentally good. This is not a sinful being. This is a new being who is good. And he is made evil by how he is treated by the scientist. Shelley is saying something here about her beliefs in human nature and what the scientists are doing. So she's blaming society for the corruption of human nature. It's just writ large in this experiment here. But the, the, but, but the Frankenstein creature is presented as the hero of the novel. He's a good character. He's committed, terrible wrongs are committed against him. Um, what are the wrongs? Well, he's created, first of all. That's not the wrong. The wrong is when, upon creating the Frankenstein creature, he is immediately abandoned. Victor, when he sees what he has done, suddenly thinks about the consequences of this. And he's so horrified that he abandons all responsibility for it and just runs away. And the creature doesn't know what to do. Because Victor loathes him. 
and he finds that every, every human being who meets him loathes him because he's a monster. He's huge, he's stitched together, he's ugly. Uh, and he is terrifying. He, he, he represents the sublime landscape, which he then goes to. They're in the Alps, by the way, which is a sublime landscape in uh, romantic uh, imagination, suggests the, uh, the power of God in the presence of nature, the, the, the great Alps that go right up into the, into the clouds in which you can see no top or bottom. It suggests a place in which God's very presence can be felt. Uh, people go on tours, including Mary Shelley, uh, to the Alps to experience this sense of, uh, of awe of the divine. They're called deists, D-E-I-S-T-S, -S, deists. They, they don't believe in revelation, they do believe in natural revelation. Not special revelation in the Bible, they do believe in natural revelation. They think that the, the presence of God can be experienced in nature, so they go to those particular types of landscapes that suggest sublimity, immensity, grandeur, terror. And, and it's filled with what? Glaciers. Remember what I said about Dante. It's a hellish landscape. Frankenstein is there and he ends up uh, uh, out of vengeance killing uh, Victor's beloved Justine. And so he wants to find him. And he goes out to find him, and uh, uh, the, 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 the creature, because he's terrified, he's like a little child, a big body, like a, he hides away, he finds that everybody's afraid of him, he hides away in a little cabin and observes some villagers, and the villager or uh, the occupant of the uh, hovel is, uh, is blind, but they love each other, the, the, the uh, man and the girl, and the creature wants to be loved and see and thinks about how he is hated as opposed to love even though he did nothing to deserve that and then he go and then he reads paradise lost and as i say here and i'm not going to find the chapter uh exactly now um he sees adam as a sort of an analogy to himself and god as the analogy to victor and yet how differently the two were presented. He, here's the, the, this is Victor telling the tale. He sees a man at some distance advancing with superhuman CG, speed. He bounded over the crevices in the ice along, among which I had walked with caution. His stature seemed to exceed that of man. Of course, we know who it is. And what does Victor say? Devil, I exclaimed, do you dare approach me? And do you not fear the fierce vengeance of my arm wreaked on your miserable head? Now you can imagine a man who's five foot whatever speaking to an eight foot giant. Aren't you afraid of me? Mm, no, but anyway. Be gone, vile insect, or rather stay that I may trample you to dust. And oh, that I could with the extinction of your miserable existence restore those victims whom you have so diabolically murdered. I expected this reception, said the demon. All men hate the wretched. How then must I be hated who am miserable beyond all living beings? Yet you, my creator, detest and spurn me, thy creature to whom thou art bound by ties only dissoluble by the annihilation of one of us. You purpose to kill me? How dare you sport thus with life? Do your duty towards me and I will do mine towards you and the rest of mankind. If you will comply with my conditions, I will leave them and you at peace. But if you refuse, I will glut the maw of death until it be satiated with the blood of your remaining friends. He threatens him. And then the monster says this, O oh, Frankensteins, be not equitable to every other and trample upon me alone, to whom thy justice and even thy clemency and affection is, not, is most due. Remember that I am thy creature. I ought to be thy Adam but I am rather the fallen angel whom thou drivest from joy for no misdeed. Everywhere I see bliss from which I am alone am irrevocably excluded. I was benevolent and good. Misery made me a fiend. Make me happy and I shall again be virtuous. So you get an account of uh, what we plainly see in uh, the creature's actions, which is an account of evil 
connected not with his sin nature, but rather with what he's driven to by the scientist. So we get here, uh, and, and this does not go away, uh, an account which is uh, basically um, rejects the idea of original sin. Because the Frankenstein creature here is given the same status by Shelley that she would hold of, of people in general. And we'll see other characters in here that the women that are presented are um, invariably saints. And they're all destroyed, by the way. And even the creature, by the way, is seen as a passive victim of the male Dr. Frankenstein. It's even presented in almost such terms. And, and one of the things that's fascinating, to, I noticed this very early on, Mary Shelley was the daughter of a famous, the most famous feminist of, of her day, Mary Wollstonecraft. She wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women. And given that, you would think, where's the female heroines? Are, are there not any, you know, strong female figures here? And the answer is um, there, there are virtuous female figures, admirable, but they have no potency whatsoever. They're all victimized. Even the, Fra the bride of Frankenstein is destroyed on the table. But every female figure is victimized and destroyed and either neglected or, or, or abused by the figures of science. So she's making an, an, a connection between masculinity and science as well. And, I know, and I've noted, and I'm not gonna expand on this here, that I think the war between the sexes is a postulate of the Romantic period. And it does not predate it. It does not predate it. It's seen as this is the way things are. And it's in pop psychology, men are from Mars and women from Venus, right? The war god versus the goddess of love. And, so, you know. and this is the way it's a, it's a psycho, psychological treatment of a, a supposedly human condition. Well, if you look at literature, um, we see no such portrait there whatsoever. It's simply not there. Not there in Shakespeare, not there in Chaucer, not there in ancient Greek literature. It's, it's not there at all. It emerges post-enlightenment, and it has a certain view of human nature, and masculinity is tied with rationality, and rationality with the scientific viewpoint of Descartes. So I'm talking about a, a string of associations. They're just vague, but they're strong enough for people to viscerally think that they're true. Which is why I think that, again, Christianity is uh, essential here to recover a sense of the, the truth of the Imago Dei, uh, the importance of rationality, but also of um, the fact that women bear the image of God as well as men. And the two together bear the image of God, for that matter. And there's a relationship through that, that physical being. And it's not a, the idea of masculinity and femininity are not constructed ideologically. They're part of the physical nature. Anyway, that's, again, going far afield here. I think that's uh, sort of sufficient. How much time have I got? I have one minute. Good. I need one minute. So that general thrust, though, of Lewis's, uh, of uh, Shelley's work here will then be picked up by Lewis and I think by Tolkien, because you can see the echoes of Frankenstein in the creation of the fighting Urukai in uh, The Lord of the Rings by Saruman. And what does Saruman do? Well, he acts like a scientist. He breaks the white light, right? He sees the things as it is, and let me break it down and find it in a more differentiated fashion, the colors of the rainbow. He breaks the white light in order to do something effective with it. And Gandalf questions him exactly for that point. He who breaks what is uh, as it is uh, has departed from the path of wisdom, he says. You almost get the modern scientist versus the, the voice of wisdom of the humanities. Things are good as they are given. As Iluvatar has given them to us, they are good. They're already good. Don't break it. It's the original sin to try and deviate from that uh, path. Lewis will present it in, in various forms in his sci-fi trilogy. Anyway, as I say, this was just a, a prelude to getting into the science fiction, but you can already see in Shelley many of the same themes that we're going to find throughout the sort of science fiction that Lewis is interested in. 
but also we'll find it in H.G. Uh, Wells' uh, First Man in the Moon, and, and most certainly in, in uh, Lewis and Tolkien's works. Okay, so I'll see you next time.